What's going on everybody? This is Jamie and welcome to the channel Thrift on Fire and welcome to a video every single day in February. I think we're at day seven. You know, things are really starting to roll now. We got to upload every single day, but so far we're keeping the train moving. Now this video is going to be a bit of a longer one. Me and my buddy John. So John is from the YouTube channel Reselling with John. I think he goes by the same handle on Instagram. I'll throw both of those. I'll link them down below. So me and John have been talking since the end of last year i forget I, I feel like it was around october we started talking about doing a podcast and we've just went back and forth about it and i decided maybe we could start doing it during my month here just to test it out so basically these are just conversations me and john are having you know we're hoping to turn this into a podcast at some point probably after this series is over so after this month is over potentially in march we'll start uploading on spotify and maybe a few other platforms like that now, the other thing I wanted to mention, we've thrown around a couple of names for the podcast. So if you have any suggestions down below, please let us know what you think would be a good name for a podcast like this. So we're thinking Canadian content, reselling content. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about eBay and Poshmark, you know, Etsy. But we really want to have somewhat of a Canadian flair, but we don't want it to be over the top Canadian. So for the time being, we're going to call this, Is This a Podcast with Jamie and John? And uh, yeah. Let's get into this. Okay, one. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, in 2024 and beyond, do you think reselling is really a stable way to make income? I know my view on it probably is much like 2023. I think you really need to like diversify where you're, where you're listing. You can't really put all your bags or eggs into one basket. Like if you're just on eBay, you're going to have tough times. I know this week has been a slow week for me at eBay where last week was a really great, great week. So writing that it would be tough but what are your thoughts on you know if re if would really be stable to consider this an income yeah i know man that's a good that's a good question and a good topic because you know i think that definitely there's potential for stable income but like you say you do kind of need to diver diversify and and it's a little bit different for me because you know i'll sell like 90 percent of my stuff as clothing which is technically recession proof but still people aren't spending as much money you know, there's a lot of economic pressure going on. There's, you know, this isn't a great time of year. Um, I think you got to diversify your platforms and something I'm trying to do this year, diversify more of what I'm actually selling. But to your point, you never really know what's going to happen from week to week. So can it be a stable income? Sure, but it might be hard to make like a weekly budget, bi bi-weekly budget, or even monthly budget if you're relying on, you know, reselling income solely on reselling income but last week was slow i i had a great sales week last week but it's because i padded it with selling off some video games my own collection you know so like otherwise it would have been like a quarter of what i'm used to yeah and you're selling on primarily ebay and poshmark right do you, you do some marketplace as well i do a little bit of marketplace stuff that i think would sell locally okay or maybe like bulkier items i don't really want to ship um but <clears throat> Yeah, I, I do a little bit. I'd say on an average week, I might have like three Facebook marketplace sales, probably a okay. couple of video games or something like that. Yeah, I know I've really ramped up my Facebook marketplace, uh, just marketplace in general, actually, whether it be Facebook or Kijiji or just reaching out to different people. When I was doing my end of month for January, I think I had about $1,300 in, um, in sales go. Obviously, that's taxable, right? So I'd have have to claim tax on that uh, and a big majority of what i find on marketplace right now is uh people want to even if they come physically to your home they still want to email and money transfer you that seems to be the new normal thing people don't like cash i love cash but i get a lot of those so you know so there's no way really to get a, get around it right that is that's income that's in my bank account you know not that if you get cash you shouldn't you should always any income you make from reselling you should always pay taxes on but you know Cash is a little more loose sometimes with people, right? Like cash depends on what you're selling too. A lot of times on marketplace, I'll sell things that I consider personal items and even not part of the reselling business. So then what do you really what do you really do with that money? Yeah, I think you can kind of get away from it, get away with it there. You know, it's probably a little bit of a loophole. And certainly I'm not an accountant and anybody watching this or listening to this shouldn't take uh, my advice. But yeah, I think it would be it seems reasonable that you could say, hey, this was a personal sale if you're doing a cash sale in person with somebody. Um, yeah. But I don't, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> I do think what you you hit the right word there because I know I've had the conversation with my accountant, which I'm definitely not a tax anything. I I pay somebody who knows what they're doing to do my taxes. I do my own bookkeeping and that's it. But reasonable is is the word that you use that exactly hits it right on the head. Like as long as you're not excessive and you're, you know, you're, you're being truthful about it, there's a reasonable amount of things that are sold cash that can stay cash because it's personal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then I think too with, uh, so I, I think I go a little further with, you know, I do some more online stuff. Uh, sorry, some more across border stuff. So like Poshmark.com, which is American. Uh, Etsy is so up and down for me. Some weeks I love Etsy. Some some weeks Etsy just leaves me with nothing. It really depends on what you're listing there, right? The Etsy is really driven towards vintage. Have you looked into Etsy whatsoever or not really? Um, I haven't. Uh, my my girlfriend she sells on Etsy, so like she kind of has a few things that she sort of does and, and sells over on Etsy. Um, and you know there are things that sometimes when we're out thrifting together, you know we make a day trip, hitting up a whole bunch of shops or whatever. We'll think to ourselves, all right, that's probably better for Etsy. And I just kind of let her do that, you know, and she'll pick that up to resell herself. And and we kind of keep that separate only because it's a little bit. Like I do cross list most things between eBay and Poshmark, but I just feel like um, it's easier if we keep those things sort of separate uh, only because like we, we kind of each have our own like accounts and logins and stuff like that. You know, it's a little bit easier just to keep track of things. But um, I thought about selling on Etsy as far as getting into some vintage stuff, but I really don't. I don't sell that much vintage stuff right now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm diversifying like we talked about, but I, where I am still mostly doing clothing, I'm just like, you know what? Poshmark works. And you talked about Poshmark US. Uh, that's something that I would probably do if I weren't in rural Western Nova Scotia with zero chance of a cross border shipper, which is, you know, a prerequisite for that. Um, yeah. I don't know a lot about it, but I do know it is possible. Um, uh, tabs, right? She's, I think she, where she in Saskatchewan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She uses a cross border shipper. She uses the same one I do, use stallion express. And I don't know if she's fully disclosed how she does it on her channel or not, but essentially I know, I know what she does is she boxes her orders up for the week or for over three or four days or whatever she's comfortable with for, um, you know, handling time on Poshmark and she ships the entire box uh, with a courier service. I think it's FedEx, like FedEx ground potentially. It's one of those. So you ship it all to them with a packing slip inside that shows everything you've sold on Poshmark. Yeah, they scan the packing slip. And now all of a sudden, all of your packages that are in that box are entered into the system and it goes. Um, I think the catch with that, because I looked at it because I thought maybe it would be worth, because I drive an hour to London and an hour back just to use Stallion. And I thought, okay, so if I had a small, like a smaller week in sales or a slower week, maybe I could try that. But the catch with it is you had to schedule the pickup from, I think, I think it is FedEx, or, but anyway, uh, 24 hours in advance. Then you would also have to have everything shipped and the weight would have to be there too. So it wouldn't give you an opportunity to add to that box. So once you created a, a shipment, It'd be sitting for an extra day and i thought for me i didn't didn't really want to go that way but i do know it is possible um yeah. whether it's worth it or not i don't know <laughs> well i've got like i said i've got a, a third party shipper that's just down the road from me and they do like ups fedex pure later canpar and a couple of others um, yep. so that's how i'm able to sometimes use something other than canada post which is sometimes not the best option for pricing wise but I don't know if they get into that. I might ask them. It's worth worth popping in and asking because it's a good. Uh, it is good to diversify, and you know, like like you say, for stability in the income, as many avenues as you can have to have that money rolling in is obviously going to be helpful. And I mean, you know, I know that from the seven thousand different side hustles I've done over the last few years. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I just I don't know if it's possible for my location. But yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. I def Definitely think it's worth it. And the one, my biggest, uh, the biggest thing I like about selling in the U.S. on Poshmark is I like getting paid in U.S. funds. And I was talking to some people at the bins who do the same thing. The Goodwill bins in London um, were talking about selling on Poshmark.com, and they were, you know, a lot of them just take the money out in 
PayPal directly to their account where I have a US, a digital US bank account through a company called Wise. And I just leave it in US funds. I have access to it through just a regular debit card or I can use my Apple wallet. Uh, but when I go to the States, I just use it, use it as regular money there. And I don't have to worry about exchange again or anything. I absolutely love that. Um, and because it's something that I don't really think about a lot, that money just sort of builds up over time. And then when we go to do something, uh, there's usually like a couple thousand dollars us sitting there that i have access to yeah you obviously yeah, still yeah, have that's, that's, taxes a nice on. that's a nice benefit for sure yeah yeah because i know if if you are taking the money back you do obviously make a little bit more money in the exchange rate but they're still going to get you on that back end a little bit right you're not getting the same exchange rate both in both directions unfortunately yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the other thing I wanted to touch base on here is seller rating. And uh, for the longest time, I had always believed 100% seller, you know, 100% on eBay for sure for a rating was necessary to make quality sales. And, you know, I now kind of think a little bit about top rated seller differently too. I don't know if you you were top rated seller. Are you still? Yeah, I'm a top rated seller, but not top rated seller plus like I don't because I don't offer the same day shipping or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, no, I don't either. But I do think over time, and I've I mentioned this on my own channel a few times, I feel like once you accept that first negative, negative feedback on eBay for sure, because other platforms like Poshmark, it doesn't really even matter. On Etsy, yeah, I think, nobody I think, even cares on Poshmark. <laughs> no, no. And I think most other platforms is not such a big deal. And I feel like I feel like even on eBay I, or anywhere you're selling, I feel like if you are a problem seller or buyer the actual, you know, whether it's eBay, whether it's Poshmark, they should come down on the person, you know, if you're the kind of guy who never ships things on time, ships broken stuff all the time, you're a problem, you shouldn't be selling on there. And that's how they should weed out the bad people, not by letting people, you know, talk bad about you or threaten you to try to, you know, get something they want or whatever. It's just, it's just so crazy. But I don't know, what are your thoughts on the, on feedback? I know you kind of think it's a little bit, um, outdated as well but yeah so so I, when i started selling on ebay i don't know what it was probably like 2020 2021 somewhere in that range i was mostly selling you know some video games for a buddy of mine who had like like high-end old school stuff you know very expensive stuff uh selling the occasional thing i could flip and you know when you're starting out feedback is important because one negative can hit you so hard and all of a sudden you're at like 88 percent feedback and it's like oh man you know so you want to get the traction but but i think that over time you just uh, for me anyway i really did stop caring now that said i've sold over 1400 items on ebay i do have 100 percent positive feedback but i did have a negative that was on my account it, it lasts for 12 months and then it, and then it falls off i didn't agree with it at all and, and was a little bit upset by it for you know quite a while because it was one of these situations where it's like you know, eBay, how are you going to allow this person to put this negative here? Like I did absolutely nothing wrong. Yeah. Um, and the situation has been taken care of. So like, why should I have this mark on my account? And because eBay is such a buyer centric platform and has essentially all but turned their back on sellers. And I say this as somebody who enjoys eBay and likes selling on eBay and obviously like make some good money selling on eBay. So I appreciate that it's there, but it is, it, it is a buyer centric platform. And when I got that negative, yeah, it was a little bit tough to swallow because I just felt like it was unjustified. Um, and I think maybe especially just like I work in a professional environment where, you know, you, you take ownership of your mistakes and you correct things and everything's just very like you dot your I's and you cross your T's and everything's all good at the end of the day. And so, um, but, you know, as time went on, I really just stopped caring because my store continued to grow. My sales continued to grow. Uh, me personally, as a buyer, if I go in and, and I see somebody has, you know, a negative or two or a couple negatives or something, or or even if it is a newer account and they've got a, a low positive feedback rating, even if it is in the 70s or 80s, I'll go in and, and read it, you know, because you can normally tell from what that feedback actually says whether that buyer is just being a pain or whether it was a justified thing. And so maybe that's an advantage of being a seller as well. You know how to actually look 
and the number itself doesn't matter as much. It's more so what's actually written. But um, yeah, I would say that even though right now I have a hundred percent, I really don't even care about it at all. I mean, it. I think I think over time you perform well enough, you get repeat buyers. People are seeing the amount of feedback you have. They're seeing quality items, and you just just roll to punches. I don't think it matters as much. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I, I do the one thing I do like that eBay has added now because well, their new thing is all the last six months anyway, they've all been about customer experience. So they let people say what they want and they don't really let you say much about it because that was their experience. But now as a, as a seller, you do get to, at the very least, if you get a, a negative feedback, you can say your side of the story. Um, it is locked in. So once you say something, it, that's what it says for forever, unless the feedback is changed, I think, to maybe neutral or positive or whatever. So that's kind of a little bit of a plus, but you're right that I do the same thing when I when I jump on somebody's account, I usually say, OK, so what are the negatives? And then I'll read through them and, and see what it actually says. And, and a lot of times, yeah, it is pretty, pretty clear as day that somebody was being unreasonable, unreasonable. Yeah. And, you know, I, like, hey, I'll just give the example because you brought it up. And that's a perfect, perfect point is about the fact that you get to actually reply to feedback. Yeah. And uh, I forgot all about that because, I mean, typically I, I, I don't because, you know, I don't, I don't think to. But on the negative, um, you know, that has since fallen off my account. I mean, it was essentially because a 40-year-old electronic item stopped working after 29 days or so of the buyer receiving it. And, and in the feedback and in the messages and stuff, he's like, oh, yeah, you know me and my kids were playing with it and my kids loved it for 29 days and then it stopped working and it's like okay i mean this thing was 40 years old yeah um you're telling me you're letting your little kids play with it all day every day for a month yeah. and then it stops working like we could have worked out something you know i i would i would feel for that person but for them to try to completely hose me for a full refund and then negative feedback and all this stuff. So I just yep. replied like, Hey, you know, I mean, if you've kind of told the story here, you know, on this, on this item, that's 40 years old, like, you know, so it was nice. At least I think that anybody that does see that negative is at least able to see my side of it. Yeah. And I, I do think that is definitely helpful for sure. And I know in, in the, I think there's one on mine that I 100, so there's one that I 100% deserve and it's because I canceled an order because somebody had bought, somebody had lowballed me and somehow I read it wrong and accepted like a $5 offer on a jacket. Oh. And I, I canceled and said, Hey, sorry, I can't ship this. Uh, they had said that I, I never messaged them or told them that that happened. And this, this actually took like two or three, two months almost. So it was in November and I just got this. A couple of weeks ago so it took them that long to realize this jacket was never coming and that they were upset about it <laughs> um you know and i canceled it and i did just say hey i canceled the order sorry i can't ship this um and i actually have already sold the jacket again for a reasonable <laughs> amount of money um so that one i guess yeah i am in the wrong because i did accept an offer whether i you know it was whether i really meant to or not i, I certainly changed my mind so that one yeah I think the other one that's sitting on my account still, one just fell off, but I think the other one was um, a pair of controllers that were shipped out working and they had claimed that the battery didn't stay charged and the, the one and the other one just didn't work or something. And I, I had stated to them, just please send them back. I'll refund your money. You know, no problem whatsoever, but they, they never responded to me whatsoever. They weren't interested in a refund. They obviously kept them. If I got something like that, and legitimately did not want it, the first thing I would do would be even go through eBay policy to get get it sent back, right? Like I wouldn't keep it. So why would you keep it yeah. and then leave feedback, have somebody message you and say, I'm willing to work with you and then not even reply? Like, you know. See, see that's, that's the thing, man. Like there's just, this is why feedback can't matter because we're, we're not a society that's reasonable anymore. You know, yeah. like, and I hate to be all doom and gloom and uh, I'm an old man shaking my fist in the clouds, but you know, it does seem like, um, it does seem like there's just such a, a short fuse in, in the whole buying and selling situation these days. E-commerce has such a short fuse. Everyone expects everything.
perfect and right now. And if it's less than perfect, it's just let's freak out, you know? Yeah. And so, like, I don't know. I just wasn't raised that way. So, like, for me, I think, you know, I, and I've been on the on the end of a bad buying experience. And, you know, I'm always going to give the benefit of the doubt and try to work with that seller to, like, make it right or give them the opportunity at least. Yeah. And um, I can honestly say I've never had to leave a negative feedback because it's either always worked out or at the end of the day, it was good enough that I could just put in neutral or, or just not even leave anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I think that there's just not enough patience, not enough um, understanding that we, you know, we are humans on the other end of this. Like, you know, I'm just a guy sitting in his basement working from home, doing my real job. And then, you know, on top of that, selling some other stuff online to make some extra money. Like, yeah, you know, I'm, it's, so, people, know, it's just weird. And people still associate um, like an eBay seller like you you or me with an Amazon seller. And a lot of times that's not really the case. Amazon tends to be, sometimes it is a, a little guy like you or me who has stuff at, on Amazon, but a lot of times it's way bigger companies selling in volume. Um, and they expect the same treatment where it's, it's not the same, but it's just, it's especially with shipping, right? Like people think Amazon's has, you know, your next day it's at your door. That's what they think everything should be like. And it's not the case. It's not reasonable. <laughs> no. you know, again, it comes back to reasonable. Yeah, for sure. So I know for myself, it's been a mediocre sales week. But uh, have you had any like really notable sales or things you were really happy to either get rid of or just, you know, something that you made a lot of money on? Is there something you really, really uh, excited you this week that you sold? You know, I haven't had any like huge, huge sales. A couple of weeks ago, you know, when I was selling some, some video game stuff, I, you know, realized one of the strategy guides that was in my personal collection was worth like 175 bucks and I'd paid like $15 for it and wasn't really... Yeah. Like I'm just a collector, you know what I mean? Like I didn't really have any attachment to it. So when I was kind of browsing through my own stuff, like, okay, what, what could I realistically get rid of to make some extra coin here and not feel bad about selling off? I realized that, at, you know, $175 value. So that went up and sold the next day. That was really cool because I wasn't expecting it. Um, yeah. Otherwise, though, the last couple of weeks have been pretty run-of-the-mill sales, but uh, I will say that I'm happy with a couple of the flips that I've made within this last week, just on how quickly they've sold. Not necessarily because I've made a lot of money, but because they were good picks and things that I normally wouldn't have picked up. So I last weekend, so yeah, one week ago today from the time of filming this, uh, we were at, you know, Salvation Army, Value Village, a bunch of different places. And I found a couple of... Uh, like vintage Aladdin Tim Hortons thermoses, like the Super Tims, like 20 ounce thermal mugs. And, you know, some of that stuff's really hit or miss, but I did just enough to research in the store, looking at sold comps, looking at sell through rates to feel confident that, you know what, I'm going to pick these up. And within a week, somebody in England actually bought both of them, paid like $53 to get it shipped over there. That's and awesome. It's just one of those things where it's like, you know what? I love putting $2 into something I'm not really sure about and it working out and getting like $30 each within a week. Like it's just rewarding to know that, that things are always growing and I'm always learning a little bit. And actually I, I know we kind of already talked about the stability and income and stuff and branching out, but this is a good example of where I have sold to somebody outside of Canada in the U S and it's paid off well so far i mean it just shipped out so hopefully there's no negative feedback or or anything goes wrong here but um i am starting to allow international sales because i think my thought process was that no one's going to want to spend that kind of money to ship something to europe or, or wherever else right like Canada yeah. Post rates are not good. <laughs> so no. who's going to want to spend $50 for a travel mug to send that to England? Well, apparently this guy, you know, and I've sold something to France a couple of weeks ago. So I'm starting to allow some international sales. Um, one of my biggest concerns was the risk involved. If something does go wrong, because you're, you're in so much money, but you know, even in just the shipping, like, how do you handle that if they claim, you know, an item not as described or something like that? Like it, 
it's almost just not worth getting it back. You, you just pretty much have to just take the loss on it because otherwise you're just spending money to maybe break even. Um, yeah. But I think that with diversifying, it is another way to help create some stable income or create another avenue for income as long as you're okay with the risk there. Because, yeah, like I say, it is risky. But um, anyway, so very long winded answer to answer this question, but kind of go back to another one. But yeah, um, I guess I don't know. It's been a weird couple of weeks, but it, it's been exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. That made me think too about it. it's unfortunately unfortunate in Canada we don't have. I think at one time we did when I first started selling on eBay, there was still the global shipping program in Canada. Right. We don't have that anymore, right? Where you just ship it to a depot and for, to eBay, and they make sure everything is you know what it's supposed to be, and they take the responsibility and ship it out from there. It's a lot it was a lot cheaper, and then no matter what happened after it got to eBay, you were covered as the seller. And the buyers covered through eBay. It's a, they still do that in the U.S. We are just exempt from that program. Um, I think if you sell on on .com instead of .ca, you can still be part of that program. But I don't know that 100% for a fact. But that is one of the reasons why you would sell potentially on .com over .ca. That's something I might look into. Then there might be a, a case where, you know, at least with certain things like that. I mean, I probably wouldn't list my hundreds of items of clothing or something, but. You know, maybe with those things that hard goods that might go uh, overseas. Yeah, I might look into that to see if, if that's an option. Uh, but yeah, you're right. The uh, the global shipping program for the U.S. is great because they just they don't have to worry about it. Doesn't matter what happens. <laughs> yeah, I know a couple of people who do sell. I know um, Chris from Chris's Treasure Chest. He does sell on dot com. I could ask him if if he is eligible for that. Um, and then. I think Steph and Ethan from the Ever Closet, they also are big advocates of .com over .ca. And it's sort of a conversation. I know when I started started selling online, I wasn't sure which one to pick. And I just picked .ca because I watched enough people say it's basically the same. And then after the fact, I've seen lots of people say it's actually quite different and you probably should sell on .com. But you spend so much time building up you know, your reputation on one. It's not so easy just to switch to the other. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as far as me, I, like I know for sales, they have been slow. And if, you know, if anybody's watching, you know, my daily vlogs here through February, you're pretty much seeing absolutely every single thing that I sell because, you know, to create content every day, I'm showing you something that I sold for $9 and something that I sold you for $109. You're seeing it all. So it's kind of interesting. But something I was, I thought was pretty cool that I sold was a Funko, uh, you'll, you probably haven't seen it, John, but I, I, anybody watching this video, it would have already already been uh, up on the channel. But I sold a Funko skateboard. I had sold one before. This one was Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie Boogie. And I picked it up at Hot Topic, which I don't do a lot of retail arbitrage. I would just happen to be in Hot Topic, I think, with my wife. Um, and they had a 50% off sale. So I started looking at the Funkos in there. And there was a Funko skateboard, and I had never seen them before. I love Nightmare Before Christmas. My initial thought was, well, if I could buy this one, get this one for free, sell the one, I'll have one for free, right? So I did that. I made money on the first one. I think it flipped for a lot more, like $140. Uh, the markets came down a little bit. I did decide to list the second one because I hadn't done anything with it besides stuck it in the corner. So I'm like, I'm just going to list this. I, it's cool, but what am I going to do with it, really? Thought about just hanging it on the wall in my eBay room and then kind of thought I'd rather have you know 100 bucks <laughs> yeah. so I, yeah so I wound up listing it it wound up selling actually to somebody less than an hour away from my house which is kind of crazy I uh, got there super quick and this one was a weird one so it was a good sale so I think I sold it for 90 bucks but I don't know if you ever had this before so they messaged me at um about 11 or 12 o'clock at night on eBay and said hey this says it was delivered tomorrow at two o'clock in the morning, how is that possible? I'm like, mm. I'm like, oh, uh, that is weird. <laughs> um, I said, yeah, like, let's just give it a couple of days and see if it shows up. I really hope it does. If not, we can open open a case. But like, I, unfortunately, I'm not the shipping company. I'm the seller, right? Um, and they got a message. I got a message from them the next morning, and they said, hey, when I got home from work. Apparently it got dropped off on their on their deck at like 2.30 in the morning, which I think is 
weird. I don't know too many shipping companies who deliver stuff in the middle of the night. Wow. Um, and he's like, yeah, it's here, but you might want to contact. He, again, he said, you might want to contact a shipping company and say, this is sort of ridiculous so that they would just leave it out here in the middle of the night. I'm like, yeah, that seems weird. I, you know, so, but also, you know, I'm taking his word for it, right? Like he's telling me these things happened. Right. I could see that it said it was delivered. I think it did show delivered at like a really weird time, but yeah, I've never had anything like that happen before. Yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because um, I noticed the other day when I was looking at tracking for an item that was coming to me, it actually showed that an item was delivered because it was out for delivery. I got that notification tracking it through the Canada Post app. And then I get a notification that it was delivered. And when I looked at the timestamp, it did show something like three or four hours into the future. Okay, so yeah. I don't know if there's like... I don't know if there's some sort of a buffer that Canada Post or maybe even other carriers put in their timestamps to allow themselves to catch mistakes or catch issues if something okay. happens. Um, because clearly, if it's 11.30 a.m., my, my item was not just delivered at 3.30 p.m. No. So I don't know why that is, but maybe maybe they give themselves like four hours in case they realize they messed up or something. They can kind of go back and like swap packages or fix something and you know i don't know it's weird i mean you're still getting the delivery notification but yeah i was the only thing i could come up with it like in my mind was it was definitely uh a friday i think so i don't know if like the carrier was just like scan pre-scanning everything delivered and then delivering them to save time like you really don't know what somebody's doing that wasn't it is this was not through canada post either this is through a parcel yeah. Carrier, but yeah weird so I'm just going to jump in for a minute. I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast here so far. Uh, we were going to edit this part a little bit differently. John gave a second answer to something that I sold from recently. But while I'm, while I'm editing this, I'm, it's very interesting. And I thought his first item was cool. So I'm just going to leave this in here. You were talking about yours. I got a notification popped up um, that I sold a, uh, a Foot Joy quarter zip golf sweater, like performance sweater. It was only 29 bucks, but I just listed it like three hours ago. So anytime I sell something same day and, and I'm like right there at that price that I'm looking to get, I just, that just blows me away. I love it. I know it's always just kind of a fluke. The right person's looking at the right time. I don't think it means I underpriced it. I think I got exactly what I should have for it, but man, I love when that happens. <laughs> yeah, that that's always exciting. And I'm always worried about exactly what you said that I've underpriced something. Did you happen to see the, um, the beaver clock that I, that I sold. Uh, I do remember you talking about it, but I don't remember the details. Yeah. So it was, so I actually picked it up because on the Scott sell stuff show uh, on YouTube on Sunday nights, I've been a guest a few times. They like to show a beaver item. So I found this beaver clock, which was a NCAA college. Uh, I can't even remember what the actual, what's what state it's from now, but whatever it was, I want to say Oregon, but I know it's not Oregon. It, it doesn't really matter. Regardless, I was going to sell it for $40 and they convinced me, no, no, that thing is like a hundred to $150. I think I listed it for 149 and it sold like within four hours of listing. And I'm like, oh, did I, did I leave me? Like, did I leave, did I leave some there on the table? Right. Or at the same time, I was going to list it for $40. I only bought it to bring it on Scott's show because I needed a beaver to show. I probably would <laughs> Walked past that and never looked at it ever again in that's my life. So, that's so hilarious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it always makes me, but it, that's just an example, but it does always make me think, God, did I price, price that too low? But probably not. I mean, you, when you're comping like sweaters like that, you got a pretty good idea of what is sold recently. It just happened to be somebody who was probably looking for, looking for that or maybe even had that saved in their search, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think sometimes we luck out. Um, but yeah, when it when it happens and, and a sale happens that quick, I just that that to me just that's validation every time. Like, okay, I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is a good feeling for sure. Um, speaking about not knowing what you're doing, but knowing what you want when you're outsourcing, do you have some something in the back of your mind, whether it's a personal rare bucket list item for yourself or just something you really have wanted to find a flip for a long time? I, I do have. For me, I think my item, which I'll, I'll share after, I think it's more personal than super valuable, but uh, I'd like to hear what yours is. All right. Well, 
this this answer probably changes periodically, but since I was selling off some of my Nintendo 64 games over the last couple of weeks, so just for some perspective, I was collecting for N64. There were only 296 North American released uh, Nintendo 64 games, and I had like 148 of them, so I was about halfway there. Yep. And I considered, you know, going for the full set. I don't care if it takes like 10 years, but there are some real heavy hitters, like and the one that I would be on the lookout for, and I was thinking about recently because I was selling some of my games because I decided not to bother going for the full set, is um, uh, Clay Fighter, the Sculptor's Cut. So Clay okay. Fighter is a really poor uh, fighting game. Like, it's just, it, it's not good. But this Sculptor's Cut was a block blockbuster exclusive. So because of its relative rarity and obscurity, definitely not because it's a good game, it has really good value. Like, I don't even know what the dollar is right now, but I think it's like $2,500 or something like that for a Nintendo 64 game. Yeah, so, I'll try to find, find one and throw it up. Uh, yeah, when I so, I mean, I'm always looking like, you know, anytime I go anywhere, I'm just looking for, like, video games. And even if it's a store that generally knows what they're doing, I still just look like, oh, my God, you know, is there the chance that they have just not realize that this was this special version, you know, versus yep. the regular version, which was also released. Like that happened recently with um, a GameCube game, like NHL 2004 for GameCube is like a $10 game. Unless you find the rare cover variant of Joe Sackick, then it's like a $100, $120 game, which I just yeah. found in Value Village for $2 the other day. Um, so that was cool. But yeah, so the, the, Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut is definitely like my bolo. My, I, I want to find that, and I don't know if it's ever going to be, you know, in a store somewhere. I don't see a lot of N64 stuff in the store, or if I'm just going to go to a yard sale or a private buy, like a Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji or something, see it, and somebody just have no idea what they've got. Um, yeah, but maybe someday. <laughs> I figure I've got about 40 more years left on this planet, and maybe I'll hold one. Uh, in those 40 years in my own hands. If not, that's okay. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, you never really know with video games that a lot, so many times, I mean, not too often they make it out to the shelf in thrift stores anymore or decent ones, but you're always hoping whether it's a video game or anything that, you know, somebody in the back doesn't realize what it is. That's, that's the key, right? Yeah. You know, there's, there's a couple thrift stores that I avoid because I know the people who work there think things are worth, sometimes more than ebay value really like stuff like um st thomas ontario which i know would mean nothing to you but that's like pretty close to me that goodwill is only about 30 minutes away from the goodwill i go to all the time and i would never go to, to the, the other one anymore because you know a pair of shoes is 30 dollars there and you know we're just talking about a pair of new balance or something right like um now mind you that's what i sell them for online anyway but i mean it's right. It just seems so bizarre to me in a small store like that that you would charge maximum price. Now you have to have the person that's going to walk in there who is that exact shoe size and they're willing to pay $30. I think that's probably fairly rare in a small town. Yeah, no, I agree with you. And actually, um, I, I know that I'm kind of interjecting here, but um, I was talking about this exact thing just a little while ago with my girlfriend because we have a fairly local store they've got some cool stuff in there. I like going in and browsing. I've bought a couple of things, but like they really just make up prices. It seems like on their video games and stuff. I mean, I saw yeah. a uh, Facebook post from them recently where it's like, you know, 25% off sale. We're doing a store wide 25% off sale, uh, video games, consoles, everything, you know? And so they got some pictures up and it's like, okay, but even at 25% off your prices are still higher than eBay. So I don't know if they're looking at like Amazon prices and being like, Oh, well, you know, this uh, this Mario 3 sells for $50 on Amazon. That must be what we put it at, you know, in our store when in reality yeah. it's a 20 to $25 game. But Yeah, or maybe just listed prices. That's a pretty big um, yeah misconception, right? A lot of people are like, they'll look at that first and not really do the research. And you're like, oh, this is super valuable. It's like, well, there's 35 of those listed and like two have sold. Like it's probably not worth what you think. You know, yeah. that's, and those two that sold went for twenty dollars, not the two hundred dollar <laughs> listing you were just looking at. 
Yeah, in a lot of cases and stuff like that, I'll still pick stuff up if it's oversaturated. If I know that I'm going to sell it way cheaper than everybody else, I'll just jump in the bottom or closer to the bottom price. You know, depends on what it is. But yeah, that's so common these days. Um, yeah, for a rare item for me, it's not, it's, it, it, there is value, but I do feel, just feel like it's more just for me. And it's like pretty much I have one autograph that I seek and it's always Joe Carter. I've got a Joe Carter baseball. Um, that signed and it came from uh, my wife's aunt used to own a gas station and she had all these baseballs that were given for um, I think there was some sort of giveaway they did it was for so I think and for some reason she had a couple left over and one, one there was a couple I couldn't even tell who they were or they were like wrecked but this one Joe Carter ball is like beautiful and so that's awesome to have but I'm always looking for the autograph my you know uh, it would be the uh, ball bat. A baseball bat autograph would be my number one thing that I would want. You would never find that in a thrift store, but being that it would be a rare, cool, or holy grail bucket list item, I would say I would blanket it and just say Joe or uh, Joe Carter autograph. But, uh, you know, I did get to meet him once, though. That was cool. I, I yeah, my, me and my wife went to uh, Winterfest, which they used to do at the Rogers Center or Sky Dome, I like to call it, but, yeah. uh, in Toronto. And there'd be plastic players, there'd be new players, there'd be um, up and coming prospects and you could like get in line to meet them. You could pay extra money for meet and greets and autographs. But the Joe Carter one was he would just, you could line up and meet him. You know, you couldn't ask for an autograph, but you could shake his hand, take a picture, talk to him. So, you know, I got, I got my 10 seconds with Joe Carter. I got the picture. Yeah. I mean, I would happily pay probably to get in another line and, and get his autograph, but I think they did it in in groups so you had to like there was like probably out of the five people he would be the only one you i would want and it's like 200 dollars to sign up for the thing or something like that right yeah yeah no that's cool man i i i'm looking at a picture of joe carter right now because i've got a small little uh blue jays like the the 92 93 world series yep. yeah nixon butts timber time in history the world championship banner will fly north of the border over there and he's on the cover of one of the vhs i have over there on the shelf um yeah, he was, man was... i remember that so vividly it was one of my favorite players and mm -hmm. yeah that's that's cool well i'll tell you this i will make this promise to you if i ever see anything uh signed by joe carter you will have first dibs oh, i appreciate it that's awesome yeah 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 it's it's funny i even even just talking about the 92, 93, like I, I get goosebumps still. It's a Here's a pitch on the way, a swing and a belt. Left field, way back. Blue Jays win it. The Blue Jays are World Series champions as Joe Carter hits a three run home run in the ninth inning, and the Blue Jays have repeated as World Series champions. Touch them all, Joe. You'll never hit a bigger home run in your life. So it's anybody who, ha who really loves. Their sports team or whatever and i had a i had a falling out with with, with sports for a bit in, in my 20s where i wasn't so in love with it i grew up loving sports and then i got more rebellious and loved music and played in bands and then as i got older and matured i'm like you know what i'm gonna kind of come back to sports and i just i love it more than i did when i was a kid which is crazy yeah i've you know i've, I've fallen away from it a bit but i still have such an appreciation for some of those uh some of that 90s stuff you know that because I mean, I'm 40, so like 93. That was you know I was 10 years old when they yep. when they won. Um, you know that's a big memory for me. Um, yeah. I mean I remember the 92 one as well, but like I you know I remember seeing him make the catch. I remember seeing him hit the home run. Yeah. And um, you know winning both of those World Series for them. And uh, yeah, it's just it's a really cool nostalgic memory. So we're gonna to try to upload one of these videos every single week here in February. So you know it's gonna be part of my uploads every single day in February. So John's helping me out here. We're creating some content together and we're adding it to the February playlist. Um, and then after that, like I said, we do kind of plan on keeping keeping this going, creating potentially a second a YouTube channel to, to host these, maybe audio only. I'm not sure if we'll do video and audio on the YouTube channel and then upload these as podcasts. Like I said, I don't know. We don't really know. We talked, I kind of cut out us chatting at the beginning where we we're talking about different names. 
of what we think it would be a good name for a podcast, but we are very interested to hear suggestions. So if you have any suggestions, link them down below. What do you think this podcast should be called? But anyways, guys, if you like videos like this, please give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing for more content and we'll see you tomorrow.